From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. CrowdStrike update goes wrong. Friday morning is canceled. The personal security implications of the AT&T breach and CDK Global reportedly pays $25 million ransom following a cyber attack. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have selected from this past week's cybersecurity headlines. Just like you would pick out a microphone from your audio settings, we've selected the perfect headlines. And now we are ready for some insight, opinion, and expertise from our guest, Adam Ariano, the former VP of Enterprise Cybersecurity at PayPal. Adam, thank you so much for making the time and being here. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here on this uh, very calm, nothing to talk about day. <laughs> yeah, everybody's just having a chill day. Uh, it seems very relaxed. And uh, there's there's no dumpster fires at all. Uh, don't worry about it. Hope all of your screens no longer are blue. Our sponsor for today is Conveyor, a market-leading AI for Trust Center and Security Questionnaire Automation. Remember to join us on YouTube Live. Do so. Go to CISOseries.com, hit the events dropdown, and look for the Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review image. You can click on it to join us, and then you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you can join us. You can join CCL. You can join some of our regulars that are in our chat, giving us their thoughts, their opinions, uh, and getting uh, feedback uh, from me and our amazing guests, uh, Adam, yourself included. So before, uh, let's give them some fodder for some comments and let's jump right in. First up here, the big story of the day, we allude to it already, CrowdStrike update goes wrong and Friday morning, well, uh, uh, let's just forget about it. A worldwide blue screen of death greeted Windows users and their CISOs this morning. Flights were canceled or delayed, banks could not complete transactions, and even some 911 services became non-operational for a time. George Kurtz, CEO of CrowdStrike, stated that the problems were caused by a defect in a content update for its Falcon EDR solution on Microsoft Windows devices. He added the issue has been identified, isolated, and a fix has been deployed. Uh, clearly, this is every CISO's worst nightmare here, Adam. But instead of being a cyber attack, this appears to have been bad luck on an overnight update, uh, something we've definitely seen before, just with w a much wider scale here. I'm curious, what went through your mind as you learned about this event unfolding today? I think the first thought that crossed my mind, and I was awake at about 2 o'clock this morning randomly and saw messages from friends in other time zones. And the first thing that I thought, especially as it was connected to CrowdStrike was, oh, that has access to the kernel. This is serious. And I did not at any point think uh, that it actually was a widespread cyber attack, it, but it is a cyber incident. And it's important to call it that as it is and not an attack because there's a lot of uh, cool sounding security companies that when attached to uh, some kind of incident like this sound like an attack. So CrowdStrike does sound like a cool, like, you know, Russian attack name, but in <laughs> fact, it was just an incident. Yeah, uh, it's not uh, Cobalt Strike or, or anything like that. You know, uh, uh, affinity uh, be darned here. I, I guess, obviously, there's going to be a lot of things. CrowdStrike uh, uh, maybe owes a lot of process explanation uh, once this is all remedial. You know, once we're on the other side of this and everyone's out of crisis mode for this, I'm curious. Like from a from a from a CrowdStrike customer perspective, is there is this a case of we were all making a, a, a erroneous assumption about reliability of software updates? Is this a, a failure of, of testing an update that's being deployed? Or is this purely like a supply side issue on this in this regard to you, from what we know so far? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll stay away from kind of speculating on causality here. I don't mm -hmm. think that anybody has a, a really good understanding outside of maybe, you know, the CrowdStrike engineers themselves of exactly how this all went down. But from a customer perspective, what you've got is a very capable, well-known and successful tool that, that CrowdStrike is, who um, on everybody's endpoints protects those endpoints from malicious activity and does so by receiving updates and receiving information from basically the mothership. And that's something that we want. This is a bug, not this is a feature, not a bug that those updates come across. Mm. And the fact that an update that came across caused this is uh, unfortunate but ultimately it's inevitable. If you give anything access to your kernel and anything that has that kind of power over your systems, the ability to auto update, you're not going to be able to test beforehand. And I actually don't think you want to test. The opposite of this is what would happen if there was a massive zero day attack, the ability for CrowdStrike to update its software was hidden behind your own change control processes and you weren't able to apply that update in time and you got owned because of that 
because of that uh, zero day, then you're in the exact same spot that we are today. And so in reality, I, I don't see a lot of things in this process that need to change. I've seen a lot of chatter back and forth. A lot of people that have said, you know, thank goodness I either, you know, was about to install and didn't, or now, you know, we're going to rethink our strategy around what company we use for endpoint detection and response. And I think that those are, are pretty um, out. Let's, the right word for it is, is uh, misguided ideas in reality. Mm -hmm. um, whenever you have a big incident like this is my favorite time to watch people and companies and how they react because you kind of get an idea of how they're going to react in, in any kind of emergency. And I think that deciding that you're going to remove or change tools over something like this is, is extremely nearsighted. In reality, what you want to do is watch how CrowdStrike responds. So, so far, and we're, what, 14, 15 hours into this, CrowdStrike's response has been extremely transparent and fast. Um, even the CEO coming out on news outlets and making sure that everybody kind of understands what's going on is very impressive. There was no attempt to hide anything. And over the coming weeks, as CrowdStrike responds and, and gives us more information, it's going to be very telling about the processes and the caliber of the people at the company. And if they perform this well, I would trust them over a vendor that has never had an incident like this because they responded to it properly. Yeah, it, it, obviously a big black eye for CrowdStrike, but I completely agree. The fact that we weren't groping in the dark to know what is happening, that we're hearing directly from the CEO um, and, and and kind of get, really getting ahead of it speaks to you know, where, I mean, if you want to call it incident response, you want to call it just PR comms, wh whatever it may be, um, it, it definitely uh, 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 stand out there. CCL in our chat has definitely uh, been feeling this. He says, uh, we are on N1 for the agent itself. Uh, maybe uh, maybe they need similar versioning features for their content. Uh, and um, we will, uh, yeah, uh, CCL, I, I think... Um, I, I, you know, Adam, I really appreciate your point of, you know, not being once bitten, twice shy when it comes to EDR, but uh, CCL, I think uh, a good point uh, from the CrowdStrike side as well. All right, we got to move on. Obviously, that's the big story, but some more. Uh, listen, we have, we've got other stuff that was the fault of malicious actors, it turns out. Uh, next up here, the personal security implications of the AT&T breach. Last week on this show, we covered the breaking news of the AT&T breach, which appeared to impact every AT&T customer, or at least a vast majority of them. What was stolen was records of phone numbers that were called or texted Texted to uh, called or texted to by customers between May 1st, 2022 and October 31st of that same year, but no content of calls or text or the time or date. But Rachel Tobeck, a social engineering expert and founder of the cybersecurity firm Social Proof Security, says this data still makes it easier for cyber criminals to impersonate people you trust, make it easier for them to craft more believable social engineering or phishing attacks against AT&T customers. So, Adam, I guess in deference to, uh, you know, Troy Hunt's uh, Have I Been Pwned, uh, maybe we can call this Have I Been Phoned? Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm 100% okay with that. Uh, As given a that, guest on the show, I won't groan too loud. But yes, I agree. <laughs> thank you. I thank you. I appreciate your politeness there. Uh, but you know, there is definitely a a lot of passive a passive data here that Tobek says allows for spoofing and social engineering. I'm curious, what are your thoughts about how vulnerable the public uh, might or might not be? following this kind of breach, where I guess it's like, it's relatively shallow in terms of like no PII, but extraordinarily uh, wide, vast. I don't know. It's the Lake Erie of breaches. Yeah. And I, I would caution the the hand wringing here again. And I, I, I feel like I'm coming off as a uh, <laughs> uh, somebody who's trying to pacify the masses here. But in reality, uh, on top of everything that everybody posts on Facebook of a certain generation, everything that everybody posts on TikTok of a certain generation, and you add this on top of it, it's not something that changes the, the actual elevation or depth of the personal identifiable information out there. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years back when the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, was hacked, every, every secret security clearance holding individual in the United States had massive amounts of very, very personal data that included relationships, addresses, phone numbers, uh, was, was hacked and leaked uh, repeatedly. By, by bad actors. And at the time, the analysis was this was going to represent a huge um, counter intel threat to intelligence services in the United States because, you know, you have all this information about all of our people with, with, uh, with security clearances. And the reality of this is, is that that didn't actually materialize. Don't think that there was much, if any, use of that data to try and compromise uh, those who are holding security clearances. There were much bigger compromises of people um, who were in sensitive locations by 
you know, leaders of free countries than there were from that hack. Um, and so for AT&T to lose this data is definitely not a great thing. It does add to the diaspora or the, you know, the level of information that's out there that can be correlated. And in an age when you can write some pretty smart scripts to correlate these things, it's possible. But there's enough out there already and enough people who don't need really fancy phishing attacks to be susceptible. This doesn't add too much to the fire, in my opinion. I, I would so it, I, that's interesting. You bring that up, uh, and, and especially uh, in relation to the uh, you know the Office of uh, Personnel Management uh, hack from a few years ago. So, do you think this would be this data being out there? Is that more beneficial to uh, you know low level phishing or to that more high level, highly targeted uh, you know kind of nation state threat actor who probably already has like a deep well of data to go to? I, I would think it'd be more valuable for um, those who are going to be doing some really sophisticated attacks. And okay. that that is a danger. And, and even the OPM hack was, is a danger in that way, in that someone who is going to be targeted by a nation state or someone with a lot of time and desire, that information can help. And, and to be real honest, it's likely that some of that has been used to fish in the past. And so my, my caution here is that a motivated attacker with time and resources is going to get you no matter what kind of information is out there publicly or not, it really just depends. Are you a target? And if you are a target, you should exact. You should very much be careful about what you do and be, educate yourself around how to block that. All right. Next up here, CDK Global reportedly pays twenty five million dollar ransom following a cyber attack. All right, Adam. Here's another chance for you to be al to to be alarmist. You, you haven't <laughs> lost your opportunity yet. Continuing with one of the big stories of this season in cybersecurity, CDK Global, the maker of specialized software for car dealerships, is reported to have paid a twenty five million dollar ransom in Bitcoin to the group that runs Black Suit Ransomware. The consulting firm Anderson Economic Group suggests that the total financial damage to dealerships in the first two weeks of the shutdown is just over six. $600 million uh, for math fans out there, 24 times the ransom amount. So Adam, while governments and security agencies repeat the mantra, you know, don't pay the ransom, it only uh, enforces that behavior. In this particular example, the analysis from Anderson shows a clear incentive for this individual, not thinking of the overall security ecosystem, but for this organization specifically to pay up uh, as essentially a cost of doing business, possibly a cheaper one than an all-out recovery. With that business pressure in mind, I'm curious, what's your take on this? Yeah, this is a fascinating one. Um, I, I recently used the example of, of polar bears and parasites. Uh, the reason why you don't call a polar bear a parasite is because it's a bit too effective um, extracting <laughs> calories from its victims, whereas parasites are, are good at taking just enough that it feeds the parasite, but doesn't kill the host. And in this case, I think this attack group, the, the group that, that performed this attack did a good job of finding the right price for what they were willing to pay, but not going overboard. And so what, what's happening in these situations, and, and this isn't um, a, you know, kidnap, the, the, the whole idea of not negotiating with terrorists or the whole idea of not paying ransoms harkens back to the time when kidnapping was was much more common and hijacking of airplanes was more common. And, and while that is an effective strategy, when the bar for kidnapping an entire person or being able to hijack an airplane is extremely high, uncommon, and very dramatic, these attacks are, are not the same level of effort and don't have the same level of um, kind of accessibility to anybody. And so I don't think that it's very practical to not negotiate and to not pay. And honestly, there, there is an economy and there's economists who have studied it. There is an economy in ransomware and ransomware actors are figuring out how high they can go with their requests. If they're not reliable, if they're not trustworthy, then they're much less likely to be paid. And so there actually is like a unspoken code of conduct basically between ransomware gangs and their victims. And in this case, I think it was a smart thing to do. Um, they you know, may have lost a moral victory, but a moral victory doesn't uh, carry too much weight compared to the amount of money that was, that was lost. Yeah, and, and yeah, I, I, like, and this whole situation has made me thinking about all those car dealerships, just like, you know, thousands of organ other organizations that are depending on you, breathing down your, like the business pressure on there had to have been just so intense, let alone the, you know, then the money that you are, you know, the revenue that you're losing every single day that that's occurring. Um, so I, I appreciate that perspective. And see, as CCL points out, uh, polar bears versus parasites is going in the old <laughs> analogy <laughs> notebook. That is tremendous. I will think of everything in terms of calories from <laughs> now on. Uh, before we move on to our uh, second half of the show, we have to spend a few moments and thank our sponsor for today, 
Conveyor. Why do teams choose Conveyor over the competition to automate answering security questionnaires? A few reasons. One, market-leading AI accuracy. Two, they don't have to maintain a crazy knowledge base anymore because Conveyor AI can read it from any source like external support sites, documents, past questionnaires, and more. Three, they can process any customer file format, even PDFs. It will leave an auto-scroll and auto-complete portal-based questionnaires. Don't believe it? Try it for yourself for free at conveyor.com. That's C-O-N-V-E-Y-O-R.com. All right, next up here, APT41 infiltrates global shipping and tech sectors. Researchers at Mandiant are warning of an uptick in malware attacks launched by the Chinese nation-state threat actor APT41 against organizations in shipping, logistics, technology, and automotive sectors in Europe and Asia. Mandiant adds that in many cases, APT41 has been present in these organizations since at least 2023. Check your calendars. That's not the current year. Adam, this activity of nation-state actors infiltrating infrastructure, occupying it rather than holding it for ransom, you know, just just, uh, very content to just dwell there for a while, continues to reappear in the news and in the eyes of some experts represents a long game for adversaries who find great advantage in embedding themselves rather than doing the old smash and grab. I'm curious, what can the hardworking CISO do to prevent their organizations from becoming an unwitting part of this type of secretive occupation from these extraordinarily advanced actors? Yeah, especially when we're talking about um, the uh, you know physical infrastructure IT. I think the most effective thing that I've seen is is uh, buying a DeLorean, souping it up just right, and then getting it about 88 miles an hour so that you can go back in time. <laughs> remind everyone that they should build in security to the infrastructure of the United States so that we don't get here. Um, short of that, the entire, you know, internet of things, the entire infrastructure IT world needs to be revamped. It just has to be. Um, at this point, you know, I actually heard this brief um, from Mandiant directly not too long ago at a, at a um, teammate event. Mm-hmm. And they were just talking about this, you know, crazy, you know, red cloud of, of threats out there. And, and what's scary about this is, is that it's not just the smash and grab that's happening anymore. And it's a little bit weird that they're entering into these systems and then just kind of staring at you, which is likely, you know, much scarier in so many different ways and waiting for the day that they're going to do something about it. Now, what the CISOs of these, um, of these telco, well, not telcos, but, you know, utility companies, um, infrastructure companies, what I, what I really wish they were doing was, um, abandoning incremental improvement. I wish that they would stop just trying to improve things slowly and go for a a whole hog, you know, get things different done now. Um, it's not sufficient to just improve things slowly when the adversaries against that are working against you are, are doing so at a, at a rapid pace. Um, but I have, a lot of opinions on the leadership value <laughs> of uh, of not just sticking your head in the sand or you know showing green on a slide that says you know hey we're improving we're five percent better yeah 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 unless you send those to the to the attackers and let them know hey guys we're improving <laughs> so just so yeah, you know don't bother don't bother yeah. we're uh, slightly better now <laughs> our our uh, our patching SLA has gone from four hundred days to three hundred and fifty so don't attack us you'll never win. Um, that, that's really what I wish I would see out of that. Um, and I may eat my words one day if I ever work for one of those, uh, you know, more legacy companies, but we'll see. Yes. The, the standing caveat of it's easy to, uh, uh, sit in a podcast and say, rip up everything and start over. Like I, yes, I, I, I wish there was the collective will and the resources quite honestly for these companies to do that. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it, it does seem like when you are dealing with, you know, threat actors that are, that are, this is their game plan. Right. And, and this doesn't even, the other aspect of that I find really interesting is we're been covering over this whole year of that. A lot of companies are preparing for post quantum encryption and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. All of these dwell time attacks where, Oh, they did, it doesn't seem like they broke anything, but so they took up some information. All of a sudden that information that they might've exfiltrated becomes extraordinarily more valuable if encryption becomes a, a you know, a trivial thing uh, in the future too. So that's, that's something yeah. I always keep in mind with these attacks as well. Yeah, for sure. And in the, I've been having a lot of conversations about post-quantum encryption this week of my own doing. And and really, um, it's not a, <laughs> you know, it, sorry, to, to divert, to, to diverge just a little bit, um, this whole idea of being able to prevent all these attacks or all these problems, like the CrowdStrike issue, um, you know, if you, if you think that you're going to have a vendor 
who's not going to take you down at some point or cause some kind of issue in your in your environment. You're, you're just wrong. It's just not going to happen. Um, you need to be not perfect. You need to be anti-fragile. It's mm-hmm. uh, a teammate, um, you know, cloak or a coined phrase that, that they have been taking on a road show. And one of the things they talk about is to leverage your near misses. So this is a near miss. When you have an attacker that's in there and hasn't actually caused any damage, it's a near miss. What are you going to do with that information? Are you going to pretend like it wasn't there? Or are you going to act like it really was something bad and then do something about it? And I would even say that the attacks that we've talked about so far for many different industries are near misses because the worst didn't happen bad things happen for sure, but the worst didn't happen. And if you're not using that to your advantage and letting a good, uh, a good disaster go to waste, then what, what are you doing in the industry? Like you have to use these things to teach your executives, teach your, um, you know, your line people, teach your sock, what should be done in these cases, because every ounce of sweat in training is a, is a drop of blood that you save in, in war. Yeah. Don't, don't fire your vendor overnight, but make your organization anti-fragile, I think is, uh, that's some that's some really solid advice. Uh, we will get out of here on this story uh, here. Uh, key sock analyst skills versus Oscar, the eater of bugs. A little bit of a long read here, but I think it's worth it here. A survey conducted by the Sands Institute identified the skills that are key to success for analysts working in enterprise security operation centers. You know them as socks. These include a knowledge of cloud security issues, PowerShell expertise, and the ability to automate repetitive tasks and system management functions. Interestingly, the respondents showed that many SOCs continue to struggle with a lack of automation and orchestration of key functions, high staffing requirements, a shortage of skilled staff, and a a lack of visibility. I think those are all pain points we've touched on on the CISO series podcast at some point or another. They also reported a pervasive silo mentality among security, incident response, and operations teams. Then in the same week, we see Google introducing an AI agent called Project Oscar, who looks for software bugs within the software development cycle. So it's not writing code, but it's kind of sitting there in the meantime being like, you sure you want to expose that API? That kind of stuff. (laughs) So Adam, a lot to unpack here in terms of comfort or discomfort that industry professionals feel about their culture, how that impacts operations, and the changes that are being posed by technologies like generative AI. I'm curious, you know, kind of two interesting pieces of news here. What's your take on this? Yeah. So uh, the, the 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 first part. Let's 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 address the sock. Um, most sock socks that struggle struggle because of a leadership failure. The failure of those leaders to actually feed and care for their sock analysts properly. They, you know, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is very important in these situations. And as a card carrying social worker, um, understanding that that any sock analyst who's only uh, time, you know, all of their time during the day is spent just over and over again, going through the same process of evaluating, triaging and fixing. If they don't have time to just sit and stare at a wall for a minute, then they're never going to develop. They're never going to become actually happy and curious and, and do important things to change the the flow of, of what's happening. And so things like Oscar coming online, which I, again, saw at RSA and I think is an, is an amazing piece of technology that's going to make a, a difference, but it's not going to make a difference because it's going to catch more things it's gonna automate tasks and hopefully what companies should be doing is using that as an augmentation to their staff to give their staff more time to think about why do I keep on getting this alert? Why is it that I keep on having this thing pop up over and over again instead of just being in a constant fight or flight mode? Uh, One of the things that I uh, have written about most more more recently is the fact that cybersecurity leaders, uh, especially at larger organizations, don't spend enough time thinking about leadership as opposed to technology. What is it that you're doing for your people? What is it that you're, um, you know, how are you preparing them for their next role? How are you making sure that they're being taken care of and guarding their time? And at the same time, giving them the opportunity to be creative. Those kind of things aren't taught enough in different courses for cybersecurity. And I don't think that they're paid attention to enough. So, um, you know, good on Google for bringing something public that they've been using already. and I feel like I feel like operations teams, SOC teams, and security teams that don't talk to each other and and have fine synergy there and make sure that there's you know mesh enmeshment. I would say to those CISOs, get better. You know, read a book about leadership. Talk to Laszlo Bach. You know, pick up an Adam Grant book and really <laughs> figure out like what is it that I need to be doing for these people at a human level because it's not just about how technical are you. It's about how good can you you know how well can you lead. Yeah, and I I. 
a lot of the conversations that we have on CISO Series Podcast, Defense in Depth, you know, are, are trying to, I think, really emphasize that. That's one of the things I've been enjoying, uh, you know, uh, uh, being with the CISO Series is kind of being led into those leadership conversations of saying, yeah, like being a CISO is not just about knowing the nuts and bolts. That's a, That can be supremely important, especially in particular organizations. But the ability to like to like on a very high level, like get buy-in to your security program, but then going down to that SOC management layer. Yeah. Like giving people the tools that, okay, these, these enrichment tasks that are, are just, glor you know, it could be seen as glorified data entry. Let's, let's see what we can do with Oscar or whatever other vendor we have out there uh, and give you time to, to actually be creative in something that ostensibly you're, you're passionate about the reason you got into this, right. Is to, to, you know, you're a problem solver. Right. That's what yeah. draws people into cybersecurity. Let's give them and, problems to solve. Yeah. And, and the flip side of that is, is if you're a security leader and I, and I, I promise to uh, some people that I used to work for, I'm not talking about you in particular. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're a security leader and you're standing in the sock during an incident and your hands are on a keyboard when you're surrounded by, you know, 15, 20 people who are trained and in, you know, the in the weeds every single day, you've already lost the battle because your head is not up and looking around, you're looking down into the logs when you've got people that know how to do that better than you. But it's a pride thing, you know, especially CISOs who started out as engineers have this, this place of pride where they want to think that they're still technical. Too many times what that means is that you're micromanaging and you're getting in the way of actual progress. Uh, one of my favorite stories that um, Jason Lee from, the, Jason Lee and, I, can I, I hope I can mention people's names directly here. <laughs> Jason Lee, Kelly McCracken, and I were on uh, at Salesforce at the same time, and they were running like the the incident response area. And Kelly was amazing because uh, when Jason would come on as the VP, and Kelly was there with you know the incident commander, and Jason would start to ask questions, she would stop the entire meeting and say, "Jason, would you like to be the incident commander, or are you going to let this person whose job it is do their job?" And serious as a heart attack, Jason was like, "Oh, okay, I will step back." Because Kelly really did a great job of making sure that roles and responsibilities were well, under, were well understood. And she had a happy group because they were trusted and they were empowered and they were trained really, really well. It turns out uh, leadership is important. Uh, yeah. As Yeah, it's. I just thought, yeah, it's all automated, right? We can just ask AI <laughs> to do it for us. Right? Yeah. That's, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Adam. This has been, I, I uh, as everyone can tell, I could keep going on about uh, these kind of stories all day. Uh, I have to, we are, we are just about out of time here, but I did want to give uh, a shout out to Tomcat, who I think is new into our chat here, uh, relating to the CrowdStrike story. Going pen and paper in retail environment is stressful. I had heard the old school uh, credit card machines. We're getting a rollout. Uh, you know, the chunk, chunk, get your carbons ready. Uh, so uh, I am so sorry if uh, you are dealing with that or across any industry, right? I mean, I, I've been seeing some uh, some horror stories at uh, airports and stuff like that. So I hope everybody's getting through this okay. And uh, I apologize to all the uh, uh, security folks that are burning the midnight oil this weekend uh, after this. So that uh, not great. And before we get out of here, was there any story that was a thumbs up or an eye roller for you, uh, either in our lineup or uh, over the course of the week? You know, I, I think uh, there's some really speculative speculative stories out there. Um, one that we had discussed previously was was uh, around, you know, the hacktivists that that went after Disney, claiming mm -hmm. that they were, um, you know, trying to defend the artists. I, 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 you know, there might be truth to that. There could be, but every single attack has two or three people that want to claim uh, claim responsibility, and and I just feel like that's a it's a stretch to believe that one. So I, I give that one an eye roll. <laughs> yes, definitely. The, it kind of seems like the more we find out about that null bulge group, the uh, the sketchier maybe. Uh, it turns out people that uh, are doing that, maybe maybe just doing it because they want to make some money. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew threat actors would be like that? Uh, so uh, Adam Ariano, the former VP of Enterprise Cybersecurity at PayPal, thank you again for being here. Where can people find you on the cyberspace uh, if they want to keep track of what you're up to? Yeah, LinkedIn is a great way to do it. It's where I publish all my articles. Uh, most of what I write and publish about has to do with leadership and technology because I think every other subject is well covered. So I'd encourage people to get uh, onto my LinkedIn page, go to the articles and read a few things. Uh, there's some pretty fun stories in there. We will have a link to your profile in the show notes. Thanks once again, Adam. This was truly spectacular. Thanks you also to our sponsor, Conveyor, market-leading AI for trust center and security questionnaires. Uh, visit them at conveyor.com. 
That's C-O-N-V-E-Y-O-R dot com. Also, thanks to our audience today. You know, we can't always get every single comment up on screen. I know uh, CCL. Listen, I said N1. I meant N minus one. You knew it. I knew it. It's, this is, you know, this isn't the easiest job up here. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to keep track of everything. I appreciate you being very nice to me and let me know <laughs> about that, but we can't always get everything up on screen. I love seeing all the comments in here. I absolutely love it. Please. We would love if you haven't joined us already, join us in the live stream. It would mean a lot. Uh, and, uh, I will react to one of your comments or something. Well, you get a heart maybe. I don't know. I'm not making any promises actually. Uh, we will not be having a super cyber Friday next week, but that's because David Spark and the CISO series juggernaut will be on the road participating in the San Diego Cyber Group meetup on Wednesday and then another meetup of CISO Series fans and cyber pros on Thursday in Portland, Oregon on Thursday. We were trying to get him to go up to Canada, uh, but he said he wouldn't keep going north. You can get more information on these by going to the events page at CISOseries.com. Be sure to check those out. But we'll be back next week with this show at 3.30 p.m. Eastern in and for another week in review. Super exciting. In the meantime, you can, of course, get your daily news fix every day through cybersecurity headlines. Give us about six minutes. We'll get you all caught up. Until the next time we meet, I'm Rich Straffolino, reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines. 